Blast off on another episode of Hero Paranormal Podcast, broadcasting from the base at La Madre Mountain, just south of Area 51. My name is Ryan, the original outlaw of the airwaves, bringing you an epic episode tonight. They don't get much better. And ever since I talked to Nathan, uh, he's a second time guest on the show, I've been itching to talk to him again. Tonight, we have the most amazing guest. For a second time, it's true. The man who has connected the dots of high strangeness in the Penny Royal Plateau. Abandoned mines with goblin sightings connected to the hit TV show Hellier. Connections to the subterranean tunnel systems of the Mammoth Cave System with more than 1,000 miles of underground mysteries. The Appalachian Mountains sit beside all this high strangeness. And it's also believed to be one of the world's oldest mountain ranges from what I understand. It doesn't stop there. The history of the area is riddled with inconceivable violence. And to top it all off, this area of Kentucky is considered the greatest anomaly in the USA from a geomagnetic perspective. And that comes from NASA and other countries' space programs. Nathan Isaac produced the Penny Royal podcast series and has been bringing the world the eerie coincidences, synchronicities, and high strangeness that the Penny Royal delivers. It's pretty wild stuff. A mastermind of research techniques connecting the dots the way only he can. Nathan, welcome to the Hero Paranormal Podcast. Thanks for having me on it. And that was a, that was a great introduction, man. Thank you so much. Uh, that was awesome. Yeah, it's all true. And... There's, you know, so much going on that, you know, I, I really want to get down there and I want to jump into this. Like, I don't know where to jump in because there's, there's so many tentacles to this mystery. And I guess a lot of them, I start with highway 39. Oh yeah, man. Yeah. So when we were digging into all of this stuff, um, I was just talking to somebody about this the other day too. Um, there, there's there's a clustering of high strangeness along Highway 39, and um, uh, in episode four of uh, season one of, of Penny Royal, um, we introduce uh, Dan Dutton, uh, who is a, f- a famous Kentucky artist that lives here in Pulaski County. He's uh, born and raised here on this farm. Um, his family um, were Pennsylvania Dutch that came from Virginia. Um, and, and there were a series of families that came here um, that practiced um, pencil, the the folk magic, you know, the Pennsylvania Dutch folk magic. And um, so they they uh, ended up on what is now Highway 39. But um, Dan explained to me that, that that particular road is one of the oldest, you know, you know and I'll say, quote, you know, roads in America – uh, because it, it was previously um, a buffalo trace um, that actually then became part of the Great Warrior Way, which a number of uh, Native American tribes um, used to travel um, uh, north to south. Um, and there are a number of maps that I found. After he told me this, of course, I, I dug, dug deep into this. Um, and, and in fact, it is one of the arms of, of the Great Warrior Way. So... So it's one of those paths that uh, people have been using to move through the United States, through North America for uh, thousands of years, and I think that's part of it. I, you know, I think I think the the movement of energy along that pathway, and um, you know, animals, humans, uh, the memories that are that are sort of infused into that path. 
um, and not just a physical path, but just, you know, in a way to a, a metaphysical path, um, has sort of primed it. Another thing that adds to the high strangeness is that there are also um, these Adena mounds that have been discovered um, by a, a man named Rathskiller. Um He was a, a polyglot from the late 1700s, or early 1800s, uh, who lived in Lexington, Kentucky. And he discovered a number of the um, early Hopewell Adena mounds, uh, burial mounds and ancient earthworks here in, in Kentucky and Ohio. And um, some of those mounds are located along Highway 39. And so so there's always been this idea that, that associated with earthworks, and I think a lot of people are probably familiar with this, um, the, these ideas of portal areas, uh, of window areas. You know, there are a lot of, of um, sightings of creatures, um, definitely in England, near a lot of the earthworks, there's sightings of, you know, the alien uh, big cats, you know, the alien, it, the ABCs, um, and definitely here in uh, Pulaski County, along Highway 39, there are numerous sightings of uh, what people here call painters, but uh, of black panthers. But there are no black panthers Whoa. in North America. There are no melanistic uh, black cats. Uh, north of Mexico, and not not since like 1903. So it's strange, that, you know. That's one of the main things that I kept finding over and over again uh, when I interviewed people here in the area. Everyone had a Black Panther sighting, and a lot of them clustered along Highway 39. Wow. Um, and on top of that, uh, there are records that there were a number of um, skyfalls. If everybody's uh, familiar with. Uh, Charles Fort and Fortean phenomena and, and his tracking of some of these things. Um, there were uh, frog falls, uh, you know, fish falls. Uh, there were reports of, the, of, a, of a meat fall in this area, which mirrored the meat fall, the Kentucky meat shower uh, that happened <laughs> in Olympia Springs, Kentucky. Um, and this all was along Highway 39, and, and along with that, numerous UFO sightings. So it... it, it it's one of the hot spots in this area um, that continues today. We, we, I mean, there there have been some recent uh, UFO sightings along Highway 39, and actually, this area uh, for the last three weeks has been in a major UFO flap. Well, I mean, I I know personally uh, over probably around 14 people that we've interviewed um, in the last you know through since the Fourth of July who have had. Uh, sightings of either triangles um, or orbs that were flying in the sky. Um, yeah, just a, a lot of strange things right now. And, and in that, sp that specific part of the county, too, that's, that's near Highway 39, toward the northern part of the county. Wow. And it's, it's one of the areas that, uh, I mean, there's Sedona, and there's obviously shapeshifter territory in the Uinta Basin of Utah, but I would say that this area rivals if not compares equally to a lot of that. And I want to get back to a lot of the things you mentioned, Nathan, but for listeners who have been living under a rock or haven't heard of the Penny Royal, as it is a fairly new topic in conspiracy media terms, can you explain some of the characteristics that make the Penny Royal Plateau unique and what drew your interest into researching it to such an extent as you have? Oh, absolutely, man. Yeah, so um, the Penny Royal Plateau specifically, um, is an area of south-central Kentucky. Um, it stretches from the Appalachian Mountains in the east, where the foothills are, um, westward, uh, to really where Mammoth Cave is, um, Hopkinsville, uh, which everybody should be familiar with, the Hopkinsville Goblins, and, you know, that's where Edgar Casey was born. Um, that's the sort of the westernmost part. And then it it goes north into um, where the bluegrass region starts, where Lexington, Kentucky is. Uh, you know, everyone's familiar with, you know, the horse farms and, and bourbon. But um, that sort of triangle that's created um, is the Penny Royal Plateau. And the, the geological features that are, are present here, um, which are in their very distinct um, features, um, it's uh, a landscape that's that's known as a karst landscape, and so 
um, a lot of, of sandstone, a lot of limestone, um, and water. Um, you know, Kentucky used to be a um, you know part of this inland ocean um, in North America, you know, long, you know, millions of years ago, and so a lot of the water has um, created massive cave systems, and, and you know, the western part of the Pena Royal includes the Mammoth Cave uh, cave system, and that stretches all the way under the Pena Royal Plateau, all the way to um, eastern Kentucky to to, you know, to Elkhorn City, which is where Hellier is. Um, and even here in Pulaski County, um, part of that cave system um, uh, that connects with that is another cave system called the Sloan's Valley Cave System. And um, that cave system is, the I think, it's the 13th or 14th largest in North America. I mean, obviously, the Mammoth Cave is the largest. But, um, but this entire region... Um, and especially here in Pulaski County, uh, where Somerset is located, you know, there's tons of sinkholes, caves, um, just this very rocky, uh, dissolved terrain. Lots of tunnels, lots of underground passageways, and so um, that is sort of the the what's above the ground, and, and also a little bit below the ground. But even deeper, and, and really what, what drew my interest to this area um, and what connects it to Sedona and some other places is the fact that this specific region is what NASA refers to as the Kentucky Anomaly, which is the largest spike of geomagnetic energy in North America. Um, the When you look at um, these... Uh, MagSat, uh, you know, imaging from these satellites. There are three hot spots in in North America. One is in southern Alaska, one is in Sedona, and then one is here in and it centers on Pulaski County where Somerset is. Um, and it's this particular one. And when you look at these maps, you can see um, these sort of mountains of of, uh, of geomagnetic peaks. Uh, that come off the surface, and by far the one here is is, is larger than anything in North America. Um, what's strange too is that the southern hemisphere really doesn't have very many, and then uh, Asia has quite a few. Uh, I think the largest in the world is probably it. I think it's in China, mm. but in North America this is the largest, and it's so powerful, so strong, that it creates what NASA refers to as a gravity high. And so the gravity in Pulaski County is slightly higher than the rest of North America. I mean, not, not by a noticeable amount, but it is detectable um, that, there, <laughs> that there is more gravity here. And a lot of people report that. You know, they come here and they, and they say they feel heavier here. And I, and, and I think that's more in, a, in, a, in an emotional sense, in a metaphysical sense, but... Um, you wonder if there's not some uh, physical element to that too, because of the gravity high. Um, but really, the the Kentucky anomaly is what what caused me to look at this place and to, and to say, you know, is this geomagnetic energy, is this intense, you know, electromagnetic field affecting the people that live here? You know, what kind of effect? does that have on the populace? And, and what we found out and what's you know a major part of the story that we uncovered is that it's caused this region to have a long history of extreme violence um, and issues with mental health. Um, and so, you know, that, that leads into all sorts of, of, of crazy stories, uh, you know, that we uncovered connected with that. But I do think that, that the, the Kentucky Anomaly is, is really sort of a foundational part of why this place experiences so much high strangeness, you know? Yeah. And it's like, it's, it's wild. I've heard the Van Allen belts have been said to dip to try to touch it. And that heavy feeling that you're discuss, like talking about, this could be part of the reason that may, maybe there is so much violence. Uh, it, it sounds similar to the Uinta Basin where people come and oftentimes they just say, I feel different. And there's, 
there's something else that's kind of odd, which is, I, I want to touch on it, is um, it's not just the geomagnetic. There's also, Pulaski County seems like an, it is an intense geomagnetic hotspot, but this this wild psychiatric situation where uh, the prosaic explanations don't seem to account for some of the violence I've heard of some pretty wild crimes down in that area, and I think there's a very famous one that um, maybe you could tell us more about. I remember a story you told me about, uh, I think you were in front of a courthouse, or can you go into that a little bit? Oh, totally. Yeah, yeah. That and, and that that was sort of the gateway um, into this investigation. You know, I moved down here. I'm not not from here originally. Um, but my wife grew up, you know, was born here, and so we moved back here about a decade ago. And, um, you know, I, I've done a lot of research into, um, you know, high strangeness is just, you know, one of those things that, you know, I love, Fortean phenomena, collecting stories, collecting folklore, um, you know, is, is a big part of what I do, especially with my research. And so, you know, when we moved down to this region, I, I, I was really digging into it, and I, I knew about the... Uh, Kentucky anomaly um, and how strange that was. But uh, soon after we moved down here, I was I was coming home from work and um, driving through the center of town, and there was this crowd gathered, and they were all holding signs up, and the signs were pointing at um, at the uh, city hall, and they were um, uh, and and the signs said you know you did it. And all these people were were, 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 were holding these signs up. So I, I get home, and I, I, I go to my neighbor's house, and I, I ask, uh, you know, what's, what's going on downtown? You know, what, what is this? You know, what, why are these, what are these people protesting? And that's when they explained to me that um, there were these two... Uh, children, or it was a, a girl who was 20, and her, um, uh, I think it was four or five years, I think it was four years old, um, half-brother, um, Linda and Cody, and um, it was July the 4th, uh, 1994, and they were last seen um, at this gas station, which is actually near my house, and they went missing on July the 4th, and they were found on July the 7th, um, and they'd been murdered on the, at the city limits. Um, I won't go into the grisly details of right. the murder, but uh, suffice to say uh, that, you know, it was, it was extremely, extremely violent how they, how they were murdered. Um, but their bodies were found on the, the city limits that split sort of the city from the county, and so when the police department arrived, there was some confusion as to whose jurisdiction it was. Um, the FBI became involved. Um, ultimately, the sheriff's department took over the case. Um, uh, a man named uh, Sheriff Sammy Catron, who was sort of this king-like figure, almost a, uh, <laughs> I'll say a messianic figure mm -hmm. um, in the community that people just believed uh, could do no wrong. He even flew a helicopter instead of uh, driving a patrol car most of the time. <laughs> and uh, they, they actually created uh, a replica of his helicopter and placed it at various grocery stores where children could pay 25 cents to ride Sammy Catron's uh, helicopter. So he takes over the case. There were some allegations that he might have been involved somehow in the murders. Again, these these have never been substantiated, um, but there were, there are always rumors like that. Yeah, I was hearing all kinds of rumors, um, and uh, files were lost. Uh, there was some some you know conduct on the part of, of investigators that um, caused the case to ultimately go unsolved for 25 years. Um, 2019 was the 25th anniversary, and um, <laughs> subsequently, Sammy Catron, Sheriff Sammy Catron, was assassinated at a fish fry here in Pulaski County uh, while he was putting two apple pies on the top of his patrol car. Um, his, supposedly, his political rival um, 
assassinate, hired a hitman who shot him. Um, and then <laughs> what's weird, you know, add another layer of weirdness to this. Sammy Catron's father was the uh, chief of police, and he was also assassinated Whoa. here in Pulaski County. But but the most but this this uh, the murder of Linda and um, Cody, you know, Dateline came to Somerset in uh, 2019 to do a special about it. Um, like I said, it's 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 been an, uh, an unsolved murder for 25 years. Um, again, if any, if anyone listening to this has any information, the you know the sheriff's department that maintains a website with a tip line. Um, I always try to remind people if, if there is anything uh, to help. But it's it's strange. It's, it's one of those things that I hadn't thought about um, the fact until after after Penny Roll, the first season was released, that July the fourth is the aphelion. It's the day when the Earth is the furthest from the sun, wow. and it's a major ritual day. And also the seventh is the day that the bodies were found. And so, you know, it adds this weird occult element to it. And and, and the people that were telling me these stories and, and explaining to me, you know, about these murders, there is a heavy element of um, cultism, cultism, you know, not, not occultism, but just that, that there might be some type of organized group in town um that were doing things and, and and so that really was my entry point into investigating a lot of the local fol- folklore was to understand where these stories were coming from you know how you know if they were true or not you know was there really a cult you know were people in power here in town involved in it um you know obviously i, I you know I, I do not believe that's the case uh currently but there are groups and were groups um, that were practicing um, ritualism and magic in this area at that time. Um, they're not connected to the murders, but it's just it's a weird layering of things. And 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 that was you know that's probably the most high profile uh, series of murders. Um, uh, and, and there's someone else that's attached that I can't talk about just because of uh, you know the family is very litigious uh, to suggest mm-hmm. uh, that this particular individual was involved but most likely he was um and it, it is the number one suspect but i did not mention that in penny royal i can't really talk about <laughs> it but um suffice to say there there are some very very strange characters that we discovered here that made me ask the question why were these people drawn to this specific area you know why did they end up here in pulaski county in this highly energetic place and then you know once we started digging into even just the violence you know and the murders we found tons of these things just it was a pile of newspaper articles of the craziest murders and attempted murders and poisonings and assassinations uh, that you've ever heard and all concentrated in this one area and 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 that's when i really started digging into the research of of how uh, intense geomagnetic and electromagnetic fields can affect people's brains and and cause them to be more violent um it's, it's just so it's strange, and, and also I think it's worth noting, and, and I mentioned this in the podcast, that um, you know there's a, a mental health facility in Lexington, which is about an hour north of here, um, called Eastern State. And we've interviewed a number of people that worked at Eastern State, and they remarked that any time someone brought up Pulaski County or was from Pulaski County, the doctors there were quick to note that, you know, it's like, what is in the water in Pulaski County, because at one point, 70% of the people in Eastern State, which takes patients from all over Kentucky, they were all from Pulaski County. 70% were from Pulaski County. And and when you look at the the sort of spectrum of mental health here in the county, there's a massive uh, mental health industry here. 
and even you know which we could talk about um, you know a, a little bit more in detail whenever you want but uh, there's also an experimental mental health facility called Oakwood Whoa. that was created here in 1973 you know it's just it, it to me it, once once I started digging into this and looking at this specific place I just kept fi- finding layer upon layer of weirdness um, that that was sort of undeniable that it had to all be connected somehow, you know? I'm so, I'm glad you said layer upon layer because yeah, it seems like it's just riddled with like synchronicities, connectivities, and you know, where you see one strange thing, another strange thing appears and it leads to other strange things. And you mentioned a few things um, earlier in the podcast, and I, one I have to touch on is, um, I, it looks like on the evening of August 21st, 1955, the Hopkinsville, this is, this is something that if people have not heard about this, it's one of the wildest stories for listeners that haven't heard about it. A, it, basically some people showed up at a police station and claimed that, uh, small creatures from a spaceship were attacking them and their farm. Can we go into that story? Cause that's just, wow. Yeah. You know, that's the, the Sutton family. Um, and they were in Kelly, Kentucky, which is just outside of Hopkinsville, but it's, you know, the, uh, Kelly Hopkinsville goblin, uh, sighting. But I think, I, I think that is the most well-documented, um, in, alien encounter um, in, in in sort of uh, U.S. history, mm-hmm. but um, yeah, the family um, that supposedly saw a light in the sky um, came down on the farm. Um, they were besieged by a series of um, you know of creatures, uh, small diminutive creatures uh, with these big ears and these big eyes. And the strange thing, though, is the way they moved. Um, and also, uh, the, the family saw them in the windows. Um, they, they, they saw them on the roof of the house. They heard them on the roof of the house. And so, you know, this is 1952, um, and they get shotguns out. And they start shooting at these things. And when they hit these things, it makes like a, uh, the sound that, that, that it would make if you shot a tin can. Mm-hmm. And they would kind of bing, you know, and, and, and sort of bounce around out of sight. And so, you know, that aspect of the case itself is extremely strange. Um, you know, it's not what you would, con- you know, think about when, you know, you consider, you know, greys or uh, some other type of traditional sort of alien um, uh, encounter. But they ended up, uh, you know, Getting out of the the farmhouse, going to the police, um, and they fight off these these aliens, and and so the police come, and and the aliens are gone. The police don't see anything, but there are tons and tons of shells. They can see evidence of that the family was shooting from inside the house at something uh, that they believed was you know attacking the cabin, and um, you know it's just it's it's an extremely strange case. It's where the phrase "little green men" originates uh, in the newspaper so in cool. regard to this uh, story. The thing that that to me is the most interesting is that this is the only verified UFO alien case that the CIA investigated, and we know that they did because. There are declassified CIA files that they sent a man named John Mulholland to investigate whether or not the Sutton family was telling the truth. And what's so strange about this is that John Mulholland was a stage magician who the that the CIA contracted to create their manual for sleight of hand. Um, and a number of other things. He also is connected later to the MK Ultra program. Dang. Uh, and so it's like, this is all, I mean, this is beyond conspiracy theory. This is all verified. You can read the documents. We know who he was. Um, and 
uh, know that he was a stage magician, know that he was there, and filed a report uh, with the CIA about uh, the Hopkinsville Goblins, and then later was involved in MK Ultra. So it's it's just <laughs> one of those strange things that that the mere fact that he was there and that he's connected to these other things, you got to start asking a few more questions, you know? Yeah, it's like it's just you the connectivity of everything is like part of that weirdness. And you had mentioned that the ancient culture of Kentucky is renowned for its massive burial mounds. And, uh, Kenneth Grant has said that the Adena may have opened some type of portal or anomaly that was never closed. Can we get into that weirdness? Oh yeah. I, I mean, this is probably one of my favorite parts of, of what we found too is, um, yeah, if people are familiar with uh, Kenneth Grant, he is um, a ceremonial magician who was uh, the origin of the Typhonian Order. Um, and he uh, was at one point Aleister Crowley's secretary. Um, and I think, it, I can't remember if he headed up the OTO at one point or attempted to, but mm-hmm. um, but he did. Ha- he had the Typhonian Order. Now, the Typhonian Order... You know, I'm not a practicing ceremonial magician, but um, but we've researched a lot of this and we've we've interviewed a lot of uh, magicians. So um, uh, it's it's interesting that uh, the Typhonian order sort of embraces even this idea of um, the, the old gods or something you know something akin to Lovecraft even. And there was a group uh, that was known as the Bait Cabal who were part of the Typhonian Order. Um, they were a magical group that had emerged from uh, a shop in New York City called the Magical Child. Um, they came from New York City. There was also a number of groups in the mid-1970s um, in Cincinnati. I think a lot of people don't realize how many magical groups were active in Cincinnati, Ohio in the 1970s. Uh, we found numerous articles about it. There were over a hundred uh, covens, but there were tons of different um, orders, magical orders that were pr- practicing ceremonial magic. Um, and among them was the Bait Cabal. And so this group that came from uh, New York City sort of merged with. Um, I think it, they were they had a publishing um, uh, co- company as well uh, that later became Black Moon Publishing. So the Bay Cabal published a, a journal called the Cincinnati Journal of Magic in the 1970s, and it was these guys were way ahead of everybody else in terms of uh, magical systems. Uh, we interviewed uh, Marco Visconti, who's a ceremonial magician in England, and um, you know he he's sort of his, a historian of these things, and and he explained to us that you know these guys were if you think of magic as um, operating systems. That the bait cabal were, you know, a few opera, a few upgrades of operating <laughs> systems ahead of everybody else. Just the way they were approaching magic. So, um, the woman, um, a, a woman named uh, Maggie Ingalls, headed up the bait cabal. Um, she was known in magical circles as N- Nima, um, and so she really is the one that was speaking to um, Kenneth Grant about the Cincinnati Vortex. And so they were collaborating and talking about um, the the fact that the Adena um, had opened this, supposedly, you know, had opened this um, rip in uh, space and time that allowed um, sort of uh, people to cross over uh, to the night side, you know, of, of like the tree of life, you know, that's how they, they kind of saw that. Love but it. it stretched from the Cincinnati area down through, you know, Kentucky over top of this area um, and sort of even over the Ashland area. But the primary place that Nima went to interact with um, this, um, you know, <laughs> this, this vortex uh, that opened up was the Daniel Boone National Forest. And so the whole eastern half of Pulaski County is this Daniel Boone National Forest. 
And what we found was that the Bait Cabal and these ceremonial magicians were traveling down from Cincinnati to Pulaski County to this to the area, and this is what's crazy: the area that they were practicing these rituals is exactly the area that is the peak of the Kentucky anomaly. There are two peaks in this county that where the the, the heart of this thing is, and one is in the uh, northeastern part of the county, and then one is in the southeastern. And the most intense one is the northeastern one. It's over a series of mines in this very remote part of the county. And the symbol of the bait ball was, um, is the bee and the vulture. And I interviewed all these people that remembered the, these um, strange people from Cincinnati coming to this property in the eastern part of the county where these mines are, where the caves are, and where Daniel Boone National Forest is. And they built this weird structure that mm. people referred to as the beehive. <laughs> and it w- had a telescoping roof that could be opened up and a hearth in the center for a fire. And people slept in these sort of honeycombed little nooks around the walls. And it's still here today. It's still out there. And people that I interviewed remembered these these strange groups coming, and they were naked in circles doing, you know, chanting strange things. Obviously, they were sky-clad. You know, the people I interviewed didn't know what that was. But um, but they were here, and they were practicing these rituals to combat. And when you read the the Cincinnati Journal of, of Ceremonial Magic, you discover that they believe these elder gods, these old gods, and this sounds like science fiction, but what? they believe that these things, these alien intelligences – were attempting to cross what what the Adena had opened up and back into our world, our dimension, to enslave humanity. So they were performing time magic rituals and vortex magic, and the and the rituals are. I, I've collected all the journals, and, and a lot of this is detailed in there um, that they were trying to stave off this invasion by these alien intelligences. And trying to save humanity, and and it's like that all was happening right at the center of the Kentucky anomaly, whether they knew it or not, Whoa. and maybe they sensed how energetic it was. But and then that specific area is where Hellier ended up. That's where the Newkirks ended up performing their you know ritual to Pan. It's where we discovered a number of other groups were practicing magic. A number of weird, strange characters, ex-Nazi intelligence agents that were owning mines in this area. Um, and the, the, it was all clustering there. And it's, it just defies belief, <laughs> you know, that, that, that these things were happening. I, I don't know. Absolutely stunning, man. It's just unreal. And the, I'm glad you brought up the Nazi aspect and the Aryan groups. Because there's some really strange things that have to do with the, I guess, fascist connections for those unfamiliar. And uh, I've got to get into the horn god pan as well. But there was a, there, there's something that I, I just can't skip over. And we'll get back to this in a minute. But um, I absolutely have to ask about the Kentucky meat shower of 1876 and get, get, have our listeners just understand a little bit of a tidbit of what the heck happened back then. Yeah, that's, uh, that's one of my favorite stories, like Kentucky, you know, anomaly stories. Um, you know, Charles Fort covers this, um, in his book of the damned, I think it's in that one or new lands, but, but it's uh, a yeah, book of the damned. Um, and you know, he's covering all of these things, you know, stories of, of, of showers of, you know, frogs and fish and things. And so the meat shower is really one of the strangest, strangest ones. And like I said, it's, uh, it happened in Olympia Springs. I can't think of the top off the top of the head, what the name of the couple is right now, but, um, but they were outside working and it was supposedly a clear sky. And suddenly these chunks of meat began to fall out of the sky, this rain of meat. 
And so they, you know, take shelter. It only lasts for a little while. And um, their neighbors come over. You know, they start inspecting this stuff. Um, for, for some reason, people took a bite of it just to see if it was really oh. neat. And they reported that it tasted like mutton, oh. which I think is strange. Um, and, uh, yeah, it's just it, it, they couldn't explain what it what it had come from. But it, some of them were... Uh, large chunks, you know, that that sort of the size of uh, the palm of your hand, um, and then all the way down to smaller pieces. Um, the only piece that is still preserved today is at Transylvania University, which is where I went to college. And I yeah. wish I had known this story while I was attending college there, uh, because I would have definitely you know, sought out the, the piece of meat from the meat shower, but in their special medical collections, they have a vial that has a piece of the Kentucky meat shower. I also think it's kind of strange that, you know, you think of Transylvania University, but, you know, Kentucky right. used to be known as Transylvania, you know, it just means through the woods. And it was the Transylvania Land Company um, that had owned all of this area until it was um, sold off and broken up into Kentucky. But, um, yeah, so uh, the the meat had fallen out of the sky. One of the uh, one of the explanations was that it was uh, what people call star jelly, or you know, like the gelatinous mass mm-hmm. uh, that sometimes falls, um, which is a controversial subject too. But the the widely accepted um, explanation is that it was vulture vomit, and so that that there was a flock of vultures. <laughs> that were flying over uh, this farm in Olympia Springs, and suddenly they all decided to, to vomit Come at on. the same time. And that's what uh, the chunks of meat came from. Oh but God. obviously I don't believe that that's no. the case. You know? Now, what, it is, what, what was it? I, I have no idea, but it's, it's one absolutely one of the strangest documented cases with actual still preserved evidence that I think has ever occurred of the Fordian phenomena, you know? Fascinating. It's just fascinating. And you're so knowledgeable about this stuff. I I do want to get into um, the Nazi connection, but I also can't skip. It's it's impossible to let's get into pan and those who have invoked and the, the horn God and his significance in the area. Yeah, so prior to um, prior to crossing paths with, say, um, you know, Greg Newkirk mm-hmm. and the Hellier team, which a lot of people are probably familiar with, the second season of that show and how it how it involves Somerset and uh, Pan. But um, before we had ever met them, there's an artist here um, that I mentioned earlier, a uh, famous Kentucky artist named Dan Dutton. And Dan uh, created a series. He's a, he's a painter. He's a sculptor. Um, he composes opera. Awesome guy. And Dan uh, created a series of operas in the 90s and the early 2000s. And it was part of a, a, it was a four-part uh, opera cycle called The Secret Commonwealth, which definitely is a nod to, um, uh, I think, Kirk is the guy's name, the, the early book on fairies from like the 1800s. And so um, he did this four-part opera. When he finished the opera, he took some time off and then began to work on a piece called The Fawn, very famous opera that he did, um, dance opera. These were all dance operas. And so um, The Fawn focused on the story of um, you know, Pan chasing Syrinx and another uh, nymph uh, to the water where he, you know, Syrinx hides in the, in the stream and um, that's where, you know, it turns into, she turns into reeds and he plucks the reeds up, cuts the reeds and then forms his pan pipe that he plays, right? Mm-hmm. So, so Dan's uh, The Fawn Opera focused on that. So while he was working on that, he ended up um, 
taking a job with the Kentucky Tourism Department. And they knew that he was a famous artist. They were choosing uh, famous Kentucky artists and writers to go uh, on these trips to create these tra travel logs. And so Dan decided to go, that he wanted to go to Elkhorn City uh, by way of uh, a town called Whitesburg and uh, document the beauty of that area. And, you know, long story short, he begins that journey and immediately falls down what I believe was uh, a fairy path, right? That that he he gets to Whitesburg and his car gets stolen and he can't find it. He gets the you know the police in, involved and they, and they end up finding his car, but it's not parked where he parked it. And it's such a small town, you can't misplace a vehicle like that. And uh, and you know he's he's someone who who prides himself on studying memory and uh, what memory means and creating these memory palaces and so um, that was strange it was like that event sort of knocked him down the rabbit hole or to, into this this world of the fae and he went on to Elkhorn City and he has this encounter in Elkhorn City where he encounters what he believes was the archetype of Pan. Now, he's deep into the research of the fawn, but the encounter itself is so strange and has all the hallmarks of, of otherworldliness, you know, of this, of this magical encounter. Um, and that, that's what we cover sort of in the, in the fourth episode. But um, Dan's entire sort of um, uh, life has, has sort of revolved around Pan, and, and, and it figures heavily into his work. So he tells me this story about this encounter that he had with Pan. I immediately, am, you know, I, I, I work a lot with film as well. And I was like, we have to make this into a documentary. We have to mm -hmm. take you. We're going to recreate the Fawn Opera with new actors and actresses. We're going to go to Elkhorn City and we're going to restage that opera in Breaks Interstate Park which is a liminal zone. It's, it's an, you know, this park that's between two states, literally. And, and that's why he wanted to go there, you know, because it's a liminal place. And so I was like, we, we're going to go there, we're going to restage the opera in the forest, and we're going to try to invoke Pan. Now, we worked on that for two years. Then Hellier shows up here in town. Um, uh, Greg Newkirk had met um, early, uh, uh, you know, a, a year or two before, Kyle Cadell, who owns the Paranormal Museum here in town. Mm -hmm. and, you know, they were at conventions together, um, and they would see each other. And so uh, we all knew about season one of Hellier. We didn't know they were filming season two, but, you know, Greg shows up in town with uh, part of the crew and interviews Kyle for some stories and then says, is, is there anyone else we should talk to and, and suggest that they speak to me because I've been collecting all this folklore, uh, doing all this research. And so, you know, if, if people have seen season two, you know, I'm in episode eight, and, and the last half of that season is in Somerset. And they ultimately <laughs> end up coming to Somerset and they are sort of following this this uh, idea that, that was presented to them in a work called The Rebirth of Pan, which was written by a very controversial author uh, who was William, William Grimstead, mm -hmm. um, who was writing under the pen name Jim Brandon. And he published this work called The Rebirth of Pan, and it tied a lot into their investigation, especially into this whole uh, Parsons, power names. Um, there were elements of synchro mysticism that were also sort of baked into all of this. Wow. Well, they come to Somerset, and they're chasing down this this cult that a witness has told them exists here, a cult that's worshiping the green man, Sunernos, the horned god, right? Mm -hmm. And... So they come here. They try to investigate that. Our paths cross. I, I don't know what all happens after that just because the show, you know, I didn't know if they were filming this for the second season or not. Well, when their show comes out a few months later and I watch it, 
you know, immediately I see that the, the episode I, I'm in is called The Secret Commonwealth, which is strange because of the sort of the synchronicity with Dan's work. And then the final episode, right, and a lot of that in, deals with Pan, the final episode, they attempt to invoke Pan here in Pulaski County, in the cave, awesome. in the area where the Kentucky Anomaly is which I don't think they were aware of all of the, the things that sort of crisscrossed in that area. But for me, when I saw that, I immediately texted Greg because I was like, dude, <laughs> Dan Dutton and I were traveling to Elkhorn City, which Hellier is a suburb of Elkhorn City, to, to do, basically to invoke Pan, and they had traveled from Hellier, Elkhorn City, to Pulaski County and did a ritual to invoke Pan. And I was like, it is beyond weird that 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 happened. And so he texted me back, and he was like, dude, I'm looking at Dan Dutton's picture on my evidence wall. And, you know, we didn't put him in the second season because I didn't know how he fit in there. And so throughout all of this, there was this heavy element of Pan. And then after their show came out, and after Penny Roy came out, I started digging into this idea of, is there a green man cult here? You know, is there any truth to that? Because it kept coming up. And then I found that there is a group that was founded in 1955 in San Francisco called the Guidonic Order. And it is a group of Welsh magical practitioners who worship the green man, Sunernos, the horned god. And they're not druids, but they perform this sort of nature magic. And in 2004, they moved their international headquarters to guess where? Somerset, Kentucky. Come on. Yeah, dude. And that's all documented. I mean, you can Google that. You can find it. It's crazy. I got chills. It's just coincidence can't explain the the synchronicities. And, you know, it's not just on the ground. Like you said, there's there's UFOs. And one thing I wanted to to tap into a little bit is the visible or or should I say invisible quote unquote creatures in the sky, the manta type undulating creatures. Um, can we tell listeners a little bit about some of those encounters? Oh, yeah, man. I mean, that's one of those things, too, that um, I had first heard uh, the, the first account of a, of a manta ray-like UFO. I think came from, um, oh, it definitely came from Coast to Coast. Uh -huh. um, one of the hosts on Coast to Coast had, not George Norrie or, or um, you know, George Knapp, but um, one of the other ones, I can't think of it, it was, which one it is, but um, he had been out at uh, the East SETI Ranch, mm -hmm. uh, which is what that's up in, I think, Washington, is yeah. that right? Or Oregon. Um, but there's the East SETI Ranch up in, on the West Coast, Northwest, and they, you know, they, they say that they can guarantee a UFO sighting. And they, they use some of these um, third generation. Um, night vision goggles, you know, to, to look at the sky and you can supposedly see um, UFOs in the infrared spectrum, but it has to be the specific type mm -hmm. and which are not sold in the U S you know, you gotta, you gotta buy them outside the U S and get them back here to see these things. So um, they were uh, at the ranch and had a sighting of this manta ray like creature uh, or manta ray like UFO where they could see through the thing. And so that's the first time I'd ever heard of that. Well, then we come to find that in 2014, I think it was 2014, um, there is a, an official MUFON report. And this is in Burnside, uh, Kentucky, which is, it, it's two miles outside of Somerset, um, southwest or south, southeastern um, Pulaski County, near the other peak of the Kentucky Anomaly, and that down sort of that southern part. Jeez. And 
Uh, it's also near a place called Alien Grave Mountain, where there was supposedly a 19, uh, 50, 1955, 1958 uh, UFO crash that was covered up, supposedly. Um, but it's, that's another a whole other story of Alien <laughs> Grave Mountain, which is strange. Um, but in that general area, there is a MUFON report in their database, very detailed, where um, a group of witnesses saw a manta ray-like UFO slash creature that was undulating through the sky above their, their house. And they could see through this thing and see the stars. But it was... It had mass to it, and so as they're looking through it, the stars shifted sort of like it, uh, uh, I, I, I always think of like Predator, mm-hmm. um, you know, the, the film Predator and how it sort of uh, refracts the light um, and that the stars were being refracted through this thing. Um, and then there was another, uh, that's actually here in Pulaski County, but Kentucky has another manta ray sighting. So there have been two in Kentucky um, in the last, you know, 30 years, but one, you know, the, the one that matters for us um, is, is the one that happened in 2014 here in Pulaski County, um, right right near where the caves are. And it's just such a strange, it, you know, this the idea of... Um, UFOs that are not just spaceships or or craft of some sort, but that might be um, some type of you know biological craft is it, so intriguing to me. Yeah, it seems like a living thing, almost almost like an animal. And 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 there, I can't remember the guy's name, but I believe there was a gentleman long time ago who used to claim these things were i, I want to say he went up in a hot air balloon and would see these yes dude have you read that book do you know what I'm? T- yeah i know i know what you're t- i can't think of his name it's just it's it's a really it's a really rare book um god i don't have a copy of it yet uh but yeah he believed that there were these gelatinous masses there are these creatures that lived in the upper atmosphere and that that's where star jelly came from that these things would die or be struck by lightning and then that's what would rain down and supposedly he went up in a hot air balloon and uh pursued these things documented these things even uh found wounded ones um, that, that, because as they die, they like drop into the lower atmosphere. Some have, have landed on the earth and then they're picked up by other ones. Um, Whoa. yeah, that's, that's, that's one of those, those stories where it's like, is there something, I mean, it's like the ocean, right? We don't have any idea what's living in the ocean. And, and you wonder like in the same way, the skies are sort of like this ocean above us that, that, you know, who knows what's living right on the edge of space, but, you know, just within our atmosphere. So, so intriguing, man. You have worked your magic connecting so many dots and this mysterious and fascinating area. Man, you're the man. I can't send enough people your way before I forget. Can you tell our listeners about the liminal lodge, your Patreon and everything else you've done to help people understand the synchronicities and intricacies of the phenomenal anomalies you've uncovered, where can people get more of Nathan Isaac? Uh, yeah, so you know, once we uh, released the first season, uh, we started a, a Patreon just to support the project. But um, it's a Patreon that's it's called the Liminal Lodge. You can go to uh, patreon.com forward slash Penny Roll Podcast, but or Penny Roll, but. Um, or look up Liminal Lodge, and you'll find us. And it's really a research group. There's, we found so many documents. You know, I, um, I filed a FOIA request with the FBI about the ex Nazi guy, and I got 1,600 pages, 1,662 pages uh, from the FBI. So it's like, you know, we've, we've got all this stuff, and, and so we formed this group for what really assistance to help us um, try to dig through this stuff, look at this evidence. And so if anyone is interested in helping us dig into this mystery even deeper and, and 
we've been going for 36 weeks now and we've got you know a weekly monday night live stream that we do we've got weekly uh research articles and we're just constantly digging into this we've uncovered so much more in the group that um it's just fascinating and it's and it's great to have a group of people with us along for the ride um so if anybody's interested in that definitely check that out um and if you want to um check out the whole podcast you know we released all ep- eight episodes at the same time um, you can go to PennyRollPodcast.com or Spotify, Apple Podcasts, all the major platforms. We're on there. And uh, we are working on production uh, of Season 2. Uh, a lot of stuff we couldn't fit in Season 1. Um, the story gets even bigger. <laughs> and uh, I was, we're looking at releasing in September, but I found so much stuff, new stuff, in the last month that it may not come out in September because we have to fit all this new stuff in there. So maybe a little bit closer to the end of the year. But, um, yeah, definitely if anybody's interested, check it out, uh, listen to the story, listen to what we found, and, and we'd love to hear from anybody that has any stories to um, to add to our research. And, and dude, thank you for having me on the show, too, and let me tell tell these stories and talk about the research. I, I'd so much appreciate it. Man, it's I know I'm 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 asking you so many questions and thank you because I'm running you through the ring. It's just there's so much that I want to hit on and you've uncovered so much, Nathan. Um, lastly, uh, just before we close out here, what I want to ask you about, I can't remember the gentleman's name. There was a gentleman who purchased a bunch of computers. They were oh, government man. owned. Can we get into that? That's just so fascinating. Oh, my gosh. Yeah. Yeah, okay. I'll, I'll try to make it quick. Okay. This is, this is totally fast, fast. And this is one of the things we just found out. Um, somebody joined the lodge, and uh, there was a member, and they just jo- they just created a Facebook account to send us a message saying, have you looked at Charles Hayes? And it was somebody, I would have totally missed this. You know, we'd found Alexander Guterma, the ex-Nazi guy, mm-hmm. and that itself was just, totally mind blowing because I was like, Oh my God, what, how could, how could no one know about this? So someone says to me, you know, have you looked at this guy? We find out to take a look. This guy lives in Pulaski County his whole life. And in 1985, he was convicted of, or was, was caught up in the largest seizure of uncut gemstones in U S history. And I'm like, well, this is crazy. And, and then in, like, 1975, he was busted for arms trafficking, like major arms trafficking, not just, like, selling some guns without checking people's, you know, background checks, but, right. like, rocket launchers. <laughs> um, he, in the 60s, we've got all these newspaper articles where he's running the Beckett Hotel here, and it's a brothel, basically, and they were running honeypot. Uh, operations to catch politicians and blackmail them. So anyway, this this guy um, is supposedly just a junk dealer. Just and and that's what everybody refers to him as is this redneck junk dealer. But when he was caught with the uncut gemstones, he had been living in Brazil for five years, representing himself as an international attorney, which is crazy, and. Um, the biggest thing that we found, the biggest connection was that he bought these computers from uh, the U.S. government, from the Justice Department in Lexington, Kentucky, um, at auction, a government auction. And supposedly they had not wiped the hard drives of software. So they, I don't know how they knew that they hadn't done this, but they, they contacted him and they said, listen, we need those back. And he said no, and so then they they were like, if you don't give us those those, those back, we'll arrest you. He says you can't. I bought them, you know, fair and square. So then the FBI raids his farm. They take the computers. They wipe it. So they give him the stuff back. Well, later it turns out the software that was on there was this very famous. This is like old school conspiracy theory. Mm-hmm. This software called and this is true i mean this existed called promise p-r-o-m-i-s and it was created by a company called inslaw uh, that operated out of chicago 
Well, the Promise software was sold to governments, you know, municipalities all over the world, all these different countries, as a private software, you know, privately developed software to connect their financial systems, their criminal record systems. But what they didn't realize is that Inslaw had contracted with the CIA to build a back door. So these salesmen were going around the world selling these things, and it's believed that Charles Hayes was, and he claims that he was an ex-CIA contractor who was selling the Promise software in Brazil, and that he was paid with these uncut gemstones. And that's that's how he, wow. you know, coming back to the United States gets caught there. Well, the government is like, this guy is not an ex-CIA agent, and he's just a junk dealer. Well, the government doesn't pay Inslaw its final $6 million payment. And that's how we know about all this, because Inslaw sued the government. There's a court case, I think it was around 1990, 1991, that w- where Inslaw sued the government. They called Charles Hayes as a witness. And the government's like, oh, this guy's a, a scrap dealer from Pulaski County, Kentucky. He doesn't know anything. He's not a CIA agent. Mm-hmm. He opens his mouth, and they immediately enacted the National Security Act. So we don't know what was said. And this guy claims, Charles Hayes claims, that he was an ex-CIA contractor who used the Promise software and bought all of this government you know, computer stuff – with a number a number of other ex CIA hackers to construct a Cray supercomputer that they were that, that communicated with the SATCOM system and they were hacking with the Promise software corrupt senators' bank accounts and finding people that were, you know, on the take with the mob, on the take with terrorist organizations, and they were sending them manila envelopes that had the evidence and a letter that said you have 24 hours to resign, or we're going to release this information. And during the period that Charles Hayes claims that he was doing this, it was the largest number of resignations of U.S. politicians in U.S. history. And so he he gained the name the Angel of Death. And uh, he said that they had built this Cray supercomputer in the back of a semi-trailer, that they were driving around Pulaski County, around Kentucky, to keep it moving. And there are there's an episode of X Files that's based on this, uh, that where they introduce the lone gunman, mm-hmm. and there's a supercomputer in the back of a trailer, you now the semi trailer is being pulled, and it's based on this story. Unbelievable. And there's so much more to it that that gets deeper into the origin of Bitcoin. And how cryptocurrency may have started here in Pulaski County. And, dude, the stuff I've uncovered. I mean, that's what the second season is about, this part of the mystery that we've uncovered. And I'm like, how is it possible that there's Alexander Guterma here, this ex-Nazi intelligence agent that, you know, is implicated in the JFK assassination? Mm -hmm. And now... Some person sends me a message and, and then closes out their account and that says, have you looked at Charles Hayes? And then we find this massive rabbit hole. And, and this all ties in, which is too much to go into, to the Danny Casolaro death <sighs> and the octopus conspiracy. And the number one witness where Danny Casolaro, just Google Danny Casolaro and the octopus, and I won't go into the story, but... What, you, what, what we found out is that his witness, the guy feeding him all the information about Promise and about all this stuff, was Charles Hayes. There were thousands of phone calls to Charles Hayes that the, the government and the investigators found after Danny Castellaro committed suicide or was suicided mm-hmm. in Martinsburg, West Virginia, you find out the number one person he was talking to, where all of this information was coming from, was Chuck Hayes here, <laughs> Pulaski County. How crazy is that? Man, the, you know, the history, the underground mysteries, they're like just layers on layers on layers. And you've done such a good job. Everybody's got to cruise over to the Liminal Lodge. Go to, 
you know, they've got to check out everything again. If you could tell our listeners one more time, just where they can uh, keep up with everything you're doing and just the inconceivable mysteries that are riddled in this area. Let's just go through it one more time and I'll let you go. I know I've kept you longer than I said I would. Oh yeah, man. No, this is, this is, dude, I love talking to you about all this stuff. Every time, every time you and I chat, I love it, man. Um, but yeah, uh, people can check out, uh, pinnerollpodcast.com or on Patreon, uh, search for Pinnerill Podcast or the Liminal Lodge. Uh, you'll find us and we're on all the platforms. I love how the podcast looks on Spotify and uh like i said we've we've got uh the second season gearing up with all of this craziness there's so much more stuff that you and i've talked about you know but um yeah join us uh it's still unfolding we're still finding so much weird stuff that i just i don't know i i count myself lucky that i've i've stumbled upon all of this and get to tell this story so um yeah uh check us out and uh um, you know, enjoy the weirdness with us. Can't thank you enough, Nathan. And I hope to talk to you soon. Thanks for getting on the podcast again. And, um, yeah, let's do it again, brother. All the best to yeah. you. Anytime, man. And thank you, dude, for having me again. I, I love talking to you. So thanks, man. Guests don't really get much better than Nathan Isaac. I mean, the guy that's connected the dots of high strangeness in the Penny Royal Plateau. I mean, everything from NASA to the CIA underground mysteries, Appalachian Mountains, wherever you think it ends, I'm telling you, friends, it's just beginning. And the nice thing about this is his research is still unfolding. Definitely head over to the Liminal Lodge, contribute on Patreon, and definitely listen to his eight-episode podcast series. Can't say enough good stuff about Nathan Isaac. And uh, until next time, keep your eyes to the skies, feet on the ground, but don't forget to take a look around. Come blast off in my time machine. Third eye feeling like an evazine. Blast off, blast off, blast off, blast off. Come blast off in my time machine. Third eye feeling like an evazine. Blast off, blast off.